this evening hosted by the Applied Ethics Institute, in which Professor McMahon from Rutgers University, professor of philosophy there, is going to give a talk called Guns, Crime, and Self-Defense. Really briefly, I should tell you a little bit about Professor McMahon. Uh, he's published at least two books at the moment, but I'll only mention the two. The first is called The Ethics of Killing. The next is called Killing in War. He's got two forthcoming books with Oxford University Press titled The Values of Lives and the Right Way to Fight. If you could please join me in expressing our appreciation for Mc Professor McMahon being here, that would be wonderful. Consistency among the positions taken or the arguments that are given, try to see what the principles underlying the different positions may be and so forth. So I'm going to try to help clarify what I think is at issue here and I'm going to consider two issues. One is whether the private possession of guns in a country like the United States makes people safer. And I'm going to consider the question whether there is a right to possess a gun grounded in the idea that there's a right of self-defense. I don't deny that there's a right of self-defense, whether uh, the right of gun possession follows from or is entailed by a right of self-defense. Let me start out by saying that the little bit that I've read in the literature by the gun advocates and the arguments I've heard when I have debated gun advocates at different places tend to focus very heavily on statistics. Um, I debated some uh, gun advocates, one a statistician, an economist, another a lawyer, and uh, a few months ago I debated somebody in Princeton named John Lott, who's been described as the guru of the gun lobby. He has a number of books on this. His most famous book is called More Guns, Less Crime. Uh, that book uh, contains an awful lot of statistics. Now, what I think is that all the statistics I've seen are of really very limited value and very limited significance. That's because we really don't have the kind of statistics that we really need. And what's more, we can't have them. They're not obtainable. What we have are statistics on rates of homicide and violent crime in different areas of the United States where there are minor differences in the distribution of guns. So people compare homicide and crime rates in one area with homicide and crime rates in another area. <coughs> but the differences in the distribution of guns in the different areas are comparatively minor. There aren't any areas of the United States uh, that have far fewer guns than other areas. Or another thing we might have is statistics on the same area in the United States before and after some minor change in the distribution of guns in that area brought about through a change in the law. 
But all these changes in the distribution of guns in these areas are comparatively minor. So we can see what happens when, when these minor changes happen. And one of the things I'm going to suggest is that what tends to happen can be systematically misleading in the way we tend to interpret it. What the statistics that we have can't tell us is what the effect would be on rates of crime, and homicide, and so on if the United States were to have suddenly a distribution of guns comparable to that in a country like the United Kingdom. We can compare rates of homicide and violent crime and rates of homicide due to gun use in the UK with what happens in the United States. And of course what we find is that the rates are much lower in the UK than they are in the United States. Um, but as gun advocates point out, those statistics can't control for cultural differences. So those statistics are going to be of limited value as well. Um, I am not happy to uh, have to concede this, but I think it uh, it is actually true that Americans tend to be rather considerably more violent than, say, the citizens of developed democratic countries in Europe. When I debated uh, this man John Lott in Princeton back in the spring, the arguments that he gave in his presentation were based primarily on statistics from two cities in the United States that for a certain period had in effect prohibitions on handguns. These cities were Chicago and Washington DC. Now there was a prohibition, a legal prohibition on handguns in these, in these cities the same for uh, a number of years in each case, though in both instances those uh, laws have now been overturned. And over those periods, in those areas, there was, or seems to have been, a rise in violent crime and homicide rather than a decrease. And it's that kind of statistic that supports the title of John Lott's book, More Guns, Less Crime. But, Here's why I think those statistics aren't particularly revealing or illuminating. First of all, there was no effort in either of those places to confiscate guns from people who had them. As most of you probably know, we don't have a gun registry in this country, so nobody really knows who's got guns and who doesn't. And this is something that gun advocates want to avoid at all costs, is making available to people information about who has guns and who doesn't. I mean, we all know who drives cars and so on. Our cars are registered, but our guns are not. So this in itself meant that it was practically impossible to enforce the prohibition on possession of handguns in Chicago and Washington, D.C. Uh, these were cities also that were located in areas <coughs> surrounded by guns. And there were no means of interdicting the importation of guns from outside of Chicago into Chicago. Same with Washington, D.C. So no efforts at confiscation of guns, no way to block the importation of guns into the cities from areas that were just awash in guns. So what would you expect under those conditions? What would you expect to be the net effect of a prohibition by the government when nobody knows who's got guns and you can't prevent them from coming into the city? I think what you'd expect is that those people who want to live within the law, many of them at any rate, would surrender their guns to the authorities. But those who need guns for a living, handguns for a living, namely criminals, would certainly keep theirs. Or maybe, if they were really smart, 
were clever. They might turn in one so they would look good with the police. And then, of course, they could go get another one right outside the town without anybody knowing about it. I mean, you don't even need to get a gun on the black market. You can go buy it anywhere. Uh, and because there's no registry, uh, there won't be any record available to the police that you've got it. So I think what would happen is you would see a net decrease in the possession of guns by people who would use them only for defensive purposes, and no decrease in the possession of guns by people who would want to use them offensively or aggressively. So it's not any big surprise that rates of violent crime would go up in those conditions. And what that shows is that a legal prohibition is going to be ineffective and probably counterproductive if it removes guns only from people who are concerned not to disobey the law, but doesn't do anything to reduce the possession of guns by criminals. So to determine the effects of an enforced and effective prohibition on private possession of handguns, what we have to do is look at societies that actually have successful systems of gun control or prohibitions that are reasonably well enforced. And again, as I said earlier, what you find is in those societies, Great Britain, for example, where I lived for a decade, uh, the rate of homicide and the rate, uh, in particular, gun-related homicide and suicide and so on is a fraction of what it is anywhere in the United States. But of course, again, as I said earlier, we can't establish cause and effect there convincingly because of the cultural differences between the countries. So let me just ask you to use your imagination for a minute. I mean, here's a little philosopher's thought experiment. Imagine that we had a kind of magic wand that could eliminate guns. We just wave the magic wand and guns would disappear. So you go to a state in the United States where you have a fairly high crime rate with, a, a, with extensive use of guns by criminals, you know, say Louisiana, for example, or my home state of South Carolina. Can you imagine that if we had a magic wand and we could wave that magic wand and all the guns would disappear except those held by the police? So both ordinary citizens and criminals, their guns would just disappear. But the police would continue to have guns. Ask yourself, would <coughs> rates of, let's say, homicide go up or down? Remain the same. Well, I'll, we'll have a discussion uh, a little bit later. We can speculate about this. Obviously, nobody can uh, confirm a counterfactual. Of that sort. Does, does, does the government in this scenario still retain its guns? Yes, it does. Okay. I'm saying the police retain their guns. That's right. Up. Pardon? I think the rate would go up. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'll let everybody okay. imagine that. Uh, my speculation is that if people are reduced to killing each other with uh, knives or with their fists or something like that, the homicide, homicide rate would drop precipitously. And I'll give you some reasons for why I think that's true in just a moment. Now, if we did wave our magic wand, then we got rid of all the questions will come after the talk, OK? Yeah, so, I didn't say you didn't make a OK, well, I'll let you make a speech after I get mine done, OK? Yeah. But since they brought me up here, I'd like to do mine first, if you don't mind. Uh, it's possible that if we waved our magic wand and all the guns were to disappear <coughs> in the state of your choice or in the whole of the country, that the rate of crime would go up. That's not implausible. Depends in part on how effective the police would be, but I, mean, I, I do want to concede, I think it's true, that if private citizens are armed, this can have a deterrent effect on crime. That seems to me pretty clear. Um, so we could, as John Lott said, um, get 
less crime overall if everybody had guns. So imagine that every resident in the United States were heavily armed within his or her house. I think it's perfectly plausible to believe that break-ins and burglaries would decline. That seems to me reasonable. Um, burglars don't like to get shot. Um, so having guns in every house would, I think, deter break-ins and burglars. If every citizen on the streets of the United States were armed or were walking around with a gun in his hand or her hand, there would be fewer muggings and fewer pickings of pockets and that kind of thing. I have no doubt that that's true. But what you have to understand is that the reduction of crime is only one value, one good thing. We could achieve a reduction of crime in lots of other ways as well. Let me ask you to think about this. Suppose our judicial system were to replace the presumption of innocence at trial with a presumption of guilt. So anybody brought to trial was presumed guilty, and what you had to do is to show that you were innocent. And suppose that we also had mandatory death sentence for anybody convicted of any crime, shoplifting, whatever it may be, mandatory death sentence and a presumption of guilt. That would reduce crime, wouldn't it? That would definitely reduce crime. Would that be a good system to have? I'll leave you to think about it. I think that that would be a barbaric society. I would leave um, if I could. So the prevention of crime is just one value that has to be traded off against other values. And having a heavily armed civilian population, population of private individuals who possess guns, comes with a lot of costs, comes with a lot of risks. Let me enumerate a few of these risks. These are the things that I think have to be weighed against what I'm conceding to be the case, namely that widespread possession of guns by private individuals can have a deterrent effect on crime. We have to look at the costs of that. One is that when guns are everywhere, both criminals and the insane can get guns very easily. And it doesn't even matter whether you have uh, background checks and stuff like that, people can still get guns very easily. You look at uh, the case in uh, Sandy Hook, Connecticut, where Adam Lanza just helped himself to uh, the guns that were in his mom's gun cabinet. Anybody, you know, if three quarters of the people on your block have got guns in their, room, in their bedrooms or whatever, it's easy to get a gun if you want one. Another cost is that the state has no monopoly on uh, the use of force. This is supposed to be a defining feature of the modern state. That, you know, if you take a political science course, what they're gonna tell you is a defining feature of the state is that it has the monopoly, a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Well, we don't have that. To the extent that any entity other than the state has access to uh, the, the means for the use of force, we are closer and closer to what Hobbes called the state of nature, that is, a state lacking proper order. What this means is that the more people have guns, the more the population approaches parity with the police force. So the police are less effective in defending people to the extent that the people are armed. Another risk uh, that comes with having a heavily armed population is that acts of passion that would otherwise have resulted in a fist fight, some sort of non-lethal injury, <coughs> result in death instead. People have easy access to guns, tempers flare, and people get shot. Um, I grew up in rural South Carolina. I know of a number of instances of that happening when I was a child. 
people in my immediate area. When people have access to guns, rates of suicide go up, irrational suicides uh, are more successful. If you want to commit suicide and it's a momentary impulse and there's a gun right there in the drawer, you don't have time to cool off, you don't have time for reflection, you grab the gun in a moment of, uh, of being upset and kill yourself. If you had to go drive to a building and jump off the building, you'd probably have time to cool off and think about it. What about cutting your wrist? Just Do you mind, uh, I save your questions for after the talk if you don't mind. Uh, you know, write it down or whatever. Um, if I let everybody do questions now, I won't get through the talk. Guns also kill people through accident. Uh, again, I know of instances of that from my own personal experience. Um, for those of you who are thinking, you know, he's just a egghead philosophy professor with no real experience of this stuff, I should tell you that I got my first gun when I was 12. Uh, I shot and killed things all the time when I was a kid. Had guns in my house from the time I was born. Uh, and I did have friends who were shot by accident. Another cost of having guns in the society is it creates a climate of fear. Gun advocates like to say that uh, uh, an armed society is a polite society. That's a euphemism for a terrified society where people are polite because they're afraid that anybody they may offend will just shoot them. Okay, so those are some of the costs that living in an armed society has. Let's go back to the problem of self-defense. Let's think about guns as a means of self-defense. What I think is that, as I tried to suggest when I gave you my hypothetical example of the society in which nobody has guns. I think that people are more secure, less likely to be killed when nobody has a gun. But of course, in a society in which nobody else has a gun, I'm going to be more secure if I have a gun. So if I'm the only one in this room who has a gun, I'm a little bit safer than anybody else. Because you can come try to attack me with your fists and I can shoot you, but I, you know, I can attack you with my fists and, and you can't shoot me. So I'm a little bit safer if I have a gun. And what this means is that whether other people are armed or unarmed, I'm gonna be safer if I have a gun. But, if I have a gun, and that gives you an incentive to have a gun to try to reestablish your equality with me, and then you and I both have guns and he doesn't, and he's at a disadvantage, then he's gonna wanna get a gun. And eventually, we're all gonna have guns, and we're all gonna be less safe than we were when none of us had guns. Think about, think about the logic here. Think about, for example, the logic of nuclear proliferation or of arms races. The logic is exactly the same. Before any country had nuclear weapons, countries were susceptible to conventional attack, but nobody was at risk of total annihilation. One country gets nuclear weapons and its security is enhanced vis-a-vis the security of all other states. Just as when one person gets a gun and nobody else has one, the person who has the gun has a greater degree of security than anybody else. But as soon as one country gets nuclear weapons, other countries' level of security have dropped. So they're gonna to scramble to try to get nuclear weapons of their own. But as each successive country gets nuclear weapons, all other countries have an increased incentive to get them themselves. And 
the end result of this procedure of proliferation is eventually everybody gets them. And people like Gaddafi get them, and Saddam Hussein, and Bashar al-Assad, and the regime in Iran. And it's not just that the risk of nuclear weapons is that people will use them intentionally and rationally to achieve their national aims. That's not really the grave danger uh, that nuclear weapons pose. The danger that nuclear weapons pose is that they will be used irrationally, or that they will be used mistakenly as a result of a false alert, or that they will be used as a result of misperception, or that there will be an accidental launch. There have actually been cases where we've been very close to that, very close to the accidental launch of a nuclear weapon against another country that itself has nuclear weapons. It sees a nuclear weapon accidentally launched coming towards it. It retaliates immediately. So when all states have nuclear weapons, everyone's security has been radically decreased because now we face the prospect of annihilation. So it's much better if no states have nuclear weapons than if all do. And it's better if very few do than if more do. <coughs> and the same logic applies in the case of private possession of guns. It's exactly the same kind of situation. As I said, just as nuclear weapons get used on the basis of, or could be used on the basis of misperception or irrationality or accident, so ordinary guns are used on the basis of irrationality, misperception, accident, and so on. Now, a number of people have suggested world government, something like that, the imposition of a Hobbesian sovereign who would be able to control the private passions of individual states as a way of enforcing some kind of security on the world. But that's utopian, at least now. But we already have the Hobbesian sovereigns domestically. These are governments and their agents, the police, that are supposed to provide security domestically. And so we're in a better position to be able to control individual gun possession than we are to be able to control possession of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, such as chemical and biological weapons, by states. And I think we'd be well advised to use our capacity to control these weapons. Let me give you um, another thought experiment. Those of you who didn't like my magic wand, um, here's another little philosopher's thought experiment for you. There are special places in the United States where there are prohibitions on guns, gun possession, that are really very effective. Those places are called prisons. Now, in prisons, guards have guns, but the prisoners don't. But given the nature of the clientele in our prisons, they're still pretty dangerous places. They're places in which, for each individual, the need for an effective means of self-defense is much greater than my need for self-defense or your need for self-defense. If you go to a prison, you're going to be very much endangered there. And you're going to need some means of self-defense. But as I said, we've got good control, gun control in prisons. Um, but these are people, like I say, who really are very endangered. Let me take a... Uh, little slogan of gun advocates and modify it a little bit for the context of prison. When every second counts, the guards are only minutes away. You've heard that from gun people, when every second count, counts, the police are only minutes away. Well, apply it to prisons. The guards aren't there to protect inmates in prisons. So let's put aside the, the, the question of uh, the, the uh, safety of the guards and the problem of escape and that kind of thing. Let's bracket that for a moment. Let's just confine ourselves to the question, would prisoners in our prisons
be safer if they all had guns? Well, I'm guessing that there really would be a decline in petty harassment and that kind of thing. You wouldn't smart mouth the other inmates in the yard or anything like that. But do you really think that prisoners in our prisons would be safer if each one of them had a pistol? It is ludicrous. Um, I'm just asking you the question because um, what I'm sure you must recognize is true is that fewer prisoners are going to be killed if only the guards have guns than if all the prisoners have guns. Uh, and what I'm claiming is same thing is true in a society that's larger than that in a prison. Okay. Um, the only clock I've got is this. What time did I begin? Seven? Seven o'clock. Okay, thank you. All right, so Chris told me I could go on for an hour. You'll be happy to learn I'm not going to do that. Um, let me now, though, turn to arguments that are a bit more philosophical. Because there is a philosophical literature on gun control, gun possession, gun rights, and that kind of thing. And I want to turn now to an argument that you will find in the literature. It's the argument that any restriction on the possession of guns, which are individuals' most effective means of self-defense, is in effect a violation of individuals' rights of self-defense. That's an argument that a number of libertarian philosophers have made in articles in the philosophy journals. Before I um, turn to that argument, though, let me make a few points about the frequency with which guns are actually used successfully for purposes of self-defense. Again, if you look at the statistical literature that's circulated by gun advocates, what you'll find is the claim that guns are used extremely often successfully for purposes of self-defense. <coughs> But if you look a little bit deeper and ask, well, where do these statistics come from? How do they get these statistics? How do they find out how often guns get used successfully for self-defense? Well, the answer is that those studies are based on telephone surveys of gun owners. And the gun owners can give as instances of successful self-defense any instance in which they're being visibly perceived to have a gun led them to believe that they had averted some kind of threat to themselves. So I remember oh, some months ago there was an article in the New York Times about um, the open carry law in the state of Oklahoma and there was a guy quoted in the article who worked in a used car place or something that occasionally repossessed cars or something. And he would wear a gun exposed on his hip and he reported to the New York Times <coughs> that some people drove up in a car and looked to him as if they were coming to complain about the repossession of a car or something like that. But then when he stood up and he showed that he had a gun on his hip, they got back in the car and drove away. Now, maybe the people in the car thought, Here's a lunatic with a gun, let's get out of here. <laughs> Who knows what they were thinking? But if he had been phoned by people who did these surveys about the successful use of guns in self defense, that would have counted as a successful use of a gun in self defense. It's all based on that person's perception. So, this is another reason I think for, think, for, for believing that the statistics aren't as reliable as you might be led to believe if you just see the numbers and don't know how they were arrived at. Okay, let's go back to the, the philosophy stuff now. 
There are a couple of libertarian philosophers whom I know who both appeal to the following analogy. They say, imagine that there's someone who is about to be violently attacked and maybe killed by a culpable aggressor. And she has a gun, but a third party rushes in just as she's about to be attacked and takes her gun away from her. And then the aggressor attacks her and kills her. They say, well, this is a violation of the victim's right of self-defense. Yeah. Clearly it is. Uh, and then what they say is, gun control is analogous to that. It deprives people of their guns and therefore deprives them of effective means of self-defense. <coughs> therefore, it violates people's rights to self-defense. Now, I've, like I said, I've seen this analogy published in two philosophy articles. But it's a defective analogy. It would be a good analogy if what gun control advocates or those who advocate a prohibition of the private ownership of guns uh, were proposing, if what they were proposing is this. You might imagine somebody proposes, we're going to take guns away from people who would use them only defensively, but we're going to leave guns in the hands of criminals we're going to disarm or abolish the police. Then that would be a good analogy. Be a good analogy for that. But of course, that's not what gun control advocates or advocates of the prohibition of private gun ownership are arguing for. Let me take for the rest of the talk the more extreme position. Position uh, that would advocate prohibition of private ownership of guns in a society. What advocates of that position propose is that all private citizens should be disarmed, but that the police and the armed forces should remain armed. Now again, earlier, if we were to achieve that state of affairs, if that were actually to come about, and there are countries in the world that approximate that, that come fairly close, wouldn't necessarily reduce people's risk of being attacked or harmed, but I think it would greatly reduce, reduce people's risk of being killed or seriously injured. And I think that would be a good trade-off, but that's not the issue here. The question is whether in that situation, people's rights of self-defense would have been violated. And what I want to suggest is that if depriving people of their most effective means of self-defense would also and simultaneously greatly reduce the occasions on which they might need to act in self-defense so that their security, their personal security, were to be overall greatly enhanced, then depriving them of their means of self-defense might indeed be some kind of infringement of their right of self-defense. But that's unimportant because the right of self-defense is purely instrumental. It's not an end in itself. It's not that it's a good in itself that I should defend myself. My defending myself is good only instrumentally, only as a means to personal security. And if I have security without having to exercise my right of self-defense, then I'm better off than if I don't have security but do exercise my right of self-defense. So take an extreme case. Again, bear in mind that this is a, a, a philosopher's hypothetical example. Imagine that somebody deprives me of my best means of self-defense, but in doing so, makes it absolutely certain, beyond any doubt, that I will never need to defend myself, that I will never be attacked. But that if I remain, if I retain the means of self-defense, I will get attacked. If the, if the right that is most fundamental is the right of 
personal security, then what we should think about that kind of case is that my rights overall will not have been violated if I'm deprived of means of self-defense as long as I'm guaranteed that I'll never have to engage in self-defense. Now, of course, gun control, prohibition of private possession of guns are never going to result in that kind of idyllic situation in which no one is ever threatened, menaced, or attacked. But the claim is that if very few people possess guns, the means of easily killing anybody around them, other people's level of personal security, in particular, their risk of being killed will be greatly decreased. And their overall personal security will be greatly increased. So even if it's true that removing from people their most effective means of self-defense will render them less able to defend themselves if they are overall more secure because other people lack the means to, to threaten them and because the powers of the police have been enhanced. There's no overall violation of their fundamental right, which is the right of personal security, to which, as I repeat, the right of self-defense is merely a means or instrumental. Think for a minute about national defense. In this country, we deny private individuals the right to participate in national defense unless they join the armed forces. This is true under international law as well. Civilians under international law are not permitted to participate in warfare. So in this country, we don't allow people to keep their own fighter jets in their backyard. We don't allow people to have their own tanks, flamethrowers, and that kind of thing. Uh, we no longer organize national defense by means of well-regulated civilian militias. That's not very good for national self-defense. So what we have are professional bodies that we entrust to protect us. The Army, the Navy, Air Force, the Marines, Coast Guard, and so on. And if you want to engage in national self-defense, as I say, you've got to join one of those groups, you've got to be trained, you've got to be authorized. And everybody seems to accept that, you know, with, with rare exceptions, you know, militiamen in Montana and that kind of thing. But most of us think that's good. We're safer that way. We're safer if we have a professional military to protect us, and we don't insist on private, privatized national security. So against external <coughs> threats, we leave it to our international police, that is, our Army, Navy, and Air Force. What I want to suggest is this does not violate our right of self-defense. As I said earlier, we are overall more secure if we have the means of warfare in the hands of a professional military rather than dispersed in the hands of the citizenry. So we're more secure if we leave our national security to professional defenders than if we rely on self-help by citizens for that purpose. What I'm claiming is same thing is true with respect to domestic security. We would all be safer if we left our domestic security to an authorized professional body of defenders. Who could be, I mean, the police force as we have it now is not altogether ideal. It can be changed, though. So the argument here is a quite general one about defense. Namely, where defense is concerned, 
whether it's domestically or internationally, it's best to put the means of defense into the hands of trained, competent professionals and not allow them to be in the hands of just everybody and trust to self-help for individual personal security or national security. give to what I've just stated. Um, and I had some more to say, but some of you seem to be so eager to get going on the discussion that I think what I'm going to do is just skip the rest of the talk that I had in mind and open it up for discussion. If I may. Um specifically with reference to the consequences, then we're going to have to weigh the benefits of gun possession against the disadvantages and the harms that, that result from gun possession. And that's what I was suggesting in the talk tonight. There, there clearly are benefits to, to gun possession. The question is whether things like the deterrence of crime through the fear that your victim will be privately armed have to be weighed against all the adverse consequences of possession of guns, which I, some of which I tried to list. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if it really could be shown that everyone would be safer and less likely to be killed if lots and lots of private individuals had guns, then I would accept that lots and lots of private individuals ought to have guns if I were thinking about it just in terms of the consequences, but that, the consequences seem to me to be the most important thing uh, here. But again, um, look around the world and where do people kill each other with the greatest frequency? Well, right here. And I just, I, I mean, as I said, you can't control for cu cultural differences here. Maybe it is true that Americans are more violent, less moral, and more likely to be insane than the populations of other countries. I, I would like to believe that that's not the full explanation of why we kill each other at so much greater rate than people in other countries do. Thank you. All right, uh, once again, thank you. I just have a question about um, your, a statement you made previously. Um, you were talking about um, how gun regulation and uh, nuclear proliferation were one and the same. That um, that nations go over and we commit a policy of nuclear proliferation towards other nations because we don't want every single person on this planet to have a nuclear weapon because of the inherent dangers that that would occur if such leaders, Muammar Gaddafi and 
Saddam Hussein would have. Mm -hmm. Now, under that same argument, however, couldn't you make couldn't you make the argument that certain individuals should have that right to bear that weapon in order to, under the same argument, protect themselves from those Muammar Gaddafi's and those Saddam Husseins who are individuals or private citizens in our country? Because there are, there are, there is right now due to our lack of police force and lack of our police effort, which in some areas can't get equal response within 45 minutes, that we need that protection in order to protect ourselves from the dangers around us, which are inherently greater, as you said, because the United States is prone to violence. So what would you say to that? I would say that, um, The ideal would again be to have a kind of global democratic police force uh, that would have sole possession of nuclear weapons so that there would be, uh, so that all countries and peoples would have some say over the use of nuclear weapons. It's much more problematic when, when certain countries alone possess them. The problem is, and the same is true with regular guns, and I'll come to that in just a second. The problem is that when individual countries can build their own nuclear arsenals and argue for the possession of those arsenals on grounds of national self-defense, we need it to protect ourselves from the bad guys. The bad guys are gonna say the same things, and if they can get the nuclear weapons, they will. <coughs> so just as, let's, let's say, a, a nice country that wants nuclear weapons only for defensive purposes wants that, there to be some nuclear weapons, but it wants it to be the one who has them. Um, as long as it's got nuclear weapons and the technology is there, the bad guys are going to get the nuclear weapons as well. They, they already have. And that's uh, the same argument on the personal level, too. And all it's the same argument on the personal level. Here, let me, just, let me just state it as crudely as I possibly can. If nice people, like you, are going to have a gun at home, criminals are going to have guns, too. Nice people want to have guns, criminals want to have guns. Either both groups are going to have them, or we can try to make neither group have them. But one thing that's true is that there's one thing that criminals and gun advocates share, and that is a desire that there be guns available. Uh, it's just that they, they, they differ about how they'd like them to be distributed. Nice people would like only nice people to have guns and criminals not to have them. And criminals would like for only criminals to have guns. In fact, they'd like to have only their little group of criminals have them and other criminals not have them. I mean, that's what I was trying to say. This is why it's a prisoner's dilemma. This is Everybody is better off if they have guns and nobody else does. But if some have guns, everybody's going to have them eventually. Just like if some have nuclear weapons, Gaddafi's going to get them eventually. Well, we're not there yet. We've only had nuclear weapons on the planet for a certain period of time. Pakistan's already got them, and Iran is heading that way. North Korea's got them. Okay. You talk about a lunatic. And uh, I just, I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, the, uh, you also made the statement previously about the prisoner dilemma. How um, prisoners are inherently we that the um, <laughs> about the uh, prisoners and guns and basically that would create a more safe environment. Well, under that same argument, could we make the statement that our own that our own federal government, as we are right now, that we are living in a sort of prison system? That if we are say if everyone say if all of, no hang on just one second if all of us had our guns taken away from us or if all if we were all became disarmed, which is guard against such an existentially authoritative force. If we didn't have, if we don't have that ability to defend ourselves against domestic forces that would try to destroy us, say, um, say an American Hitler, or say some sort of autocrat tries to take control of power, how would we be able to raise our own voice if we don't have the force or means to back up our own democracy? Well, there are all kinds of ways of doing that. Um, there's a large literature on nonviolent resistance, which can be very effective. Nonviolent against violence, right? Not 
I'll give you an opportunity to speak, though. If yeah, Professor McKenna um, can speak, we'll come back around. Okay. Did you want to? Yeah, I want to say something about that. Okay, imagine that. Well, let me say two things. First of all, think about what happened in Egypt. Now, I know things have evolved in ways that were undesirable there. But think back to Egypt a couple of years ago. You had vast numbers of people assembling in Tahrir Square, protesting against a government that was genuinely tyrannical, genuinely suppressed people's freedom in ways that would be unimaginable here. And they're back to that now with a, with a, with a military coup of the government. I mean, if you really think that's possible here, I think you're living in a fantasy world. We have, a, we have a democracy here. and But first of all, let me just say, if people had gone to Tahrir Square armed to the teeth, there would have been massive violence. Thousands and thousands of people would have been killed. The government would have stayed in power. Uh, I mean, it's kind of back in power now, but Mubarak would never have left, and so on. So what I'm claiming is this fantasy that you're going to be able to overthrow a tyrannical domestic government with your little pop guns and so on is just that. It's a fantasy. You're not going to be able to fight against government. Secondly, the other point I wanted to make is just this, that you're assuming government's going to be tyrannical and it's government against the whole entire population. That's not the way it's going to be. If everybody is armed in this country and some of the people think the government is tyrannical and are then decide that we're going to defend ourselves against the government with our guns. You've got to remember that there's going to be the other half of the population who disagree with you. And what you're going to have is a civil war in which everybody kills everybody. And I guarantee you that's worse than if you have an unarmed population against a tyrannical government. But if you think that we're going to get a Hitler here, you're, you're, you're wrong. Now, you're thinking hypothetical. It's not a, um, it's not a valid argument. So there's three questions over here, and then I'll work my way back around. Uh, here. Chris, Chris, let this gentleman on the front row have his say. I think he's been waiting for a long time. Oh, yeah. uh, I will. I will, but two from now, because it's apparently following up on that one. Oh, so that's okay. So right after this gentleman back there. Thank you again. That's not entirely true. Um, the reason that's not entirely true is that there is something called arms control. And there is something called the Non-Proliferation Treaty and so on. And the way you discourage proliferation and so on, and the way that you reduce stockpile of nuclear weapons by countries like the Soviet Union is by agreeing to reduce your own. You look at the history of arms control, and what it consists of is not our forcing the Soviet Union unilaterally to eliminate its nuclear weapons. 
it consists of a process of mutual accommodation where they give up theirs or refuse to get some or, or agree not to acquire them only if we reduce ours and provide them with security guarantees and so on and so forth. Um, it's reduced, not eliminated, right? We're not it's reduced, not eliminated. 